Hi and welcome to this video on Life on Earth and today we're going to be looking at evolution. And so the first thing we need to know on this section is the fact that life on Earth is um, 3,500 million years old or 3.5 billion years old. <clears throat> and the first life forms um, that were present on the Earth were very simple um, single celled organisms and for the first um, at least 2.5 billion years we only had single celled or very very simplistic organisms found on the Earth. And so the change to an organism over time is due to variation. This can be caused by two things. And so this can be caused by the environment and more specifically by the genes. And obviously um, if it's caused by the environment, we'd refer to that as acquired. Um, and if it's caused by um, the genes, that can be inherited. And so genetic variation can be things like, you might have heard of it before, tongue rolling or eye colour. Um, or skin colour or hair colour or in this case um, the example of the peppered moth. Environmental variation due to obviously the conditions that some an organism has lived in, and so an example in humans might be um, piercings, hair colour, hairstyle, um, something of that nature. But what we're really interested in is genetic variation because genetic variation enables characteristics to be passed on to the next generation. And so natural selection is a term you might hear quite frequently, um, and what it is is it's the reasoning or the um, explanation for how organisms change. So all evolution means is organisms changing. What natural selection provides is the explanation for how that change has occurred. And so the scientist that first put forward this theory was Charles Darwin um, in the mid 1800s. And so scientists had been aware before this point that organisms had changed and they hadn't always been static or stayed the same. What Charles Darwin did is he gave the explanation for how those organisms changed um, and the explanation for that is natural selection and it's probably best explained with an example. And so the example we're going to use today is of these two moths and so this first you've got two varieties, the lighter coloured and the darker coloured variety and they live on um, tree bark. Now prior to the industrial revolution um, these moths could live on tree bark and effectively because the tree bark was a lighter colour there um, some of the darker ones stood out more to predators like birds and so it would have meant that some of these darker coloured organisms um, would have been or not as favoured as much as some of the lighter varieties. Now during the industrial revolution what would have happened is masses of um, coal would have been burnt and that would have produced soot and this soot would have been deposited on the surface of this tree bark and so now what's happened is the white coloured variety has stood out against the dark background of the tree bark and this meant that this would have favoured um, the population of the darker coloured moths and so what would have ended up happening is the number of white moths would have reduced because they'd have been eaten by birds and that would have left behind um, just the dark coloured moths and effectively what happened was because um, there were a number of these dark moths being left behind and because they therefore they had less competition from other white um, moths, they could prosper and survive. And so as they're more likely to survive, they're therefore more likely to be able to breed and therefore pass on their characteristics to the next generation. And so what you would then find is the next genera generation of moths after the Industrial Revolution predominantly would have been um, a darker colour. And so what we find is around the Industrial Revolution, you see the number of dark moths that were increasing, the level of light moths that were decreasing. And so what's happened is there's been an environmental change that's meant that the dark moths were better suited to their environment. And that leads us on to the idea of survival of the fittest. And so in this example, we've got a, a shorter neck giraffe and a longer neck giraffe. And effectively, because the longer neck giraffe um, was better suited to its environment because it had a longer neck to reach um, the leaves of the tree it was favoured over the shorter necked um, giraffe and so it had been selected by nature now this can get quite confusing when you when you start to say things like selected by nature that kind of implies that there's a will behind it but all it simply means is it's best suited to its environment there's no will behind which organism um, survives and which does not very simply it's either very well suited to its environment and it can survive and pass on its genes or it's not and it does not. And in this case what would have happened was the shorter neck giraffes would have not survived therefore not been able to breed but the longer neck ones would. So they would have outcompeted their shorter neck cousins and therefore they would have eaten, they would have survived 
and therefore they could go on to reproduce and pass on their genes to the next generation. So the following generations of giraffes would all have longer necks and therefore on the next generation again what you'd end up seeing is the longer neck ones again because they could reach more leaves would have been favoured and therefore they would have survived passed on their genes to the next generation and therefore the next generation of giraffes would have had even longer necks. Now in a very simplistic way this diagram will show what um, how evolution by natural selection can occur so within a simple organism um, you can get a random mutation and if this mutation is favourable, it means that that one is more likely to survive. And all a mutation mean, means is a change in the genetic material. And then if that mutation is favourable, that organism is more likely to survive, therefore more likely to reproduce. And from there, you get another mutation in this instance. And again, if this mutation is favourable, that can be passed on to the next generation. And again, we've got another mutation here, therefore you're going to if that one again is favourable, that's going to go on and survive, pass on its genes to the next generation, and so on and so forth. In this example, it's gone from a simple organism to a complex one in, a, in around five generations. That is clearly, clearly too quick. In order to see changes within living organisms, you'd need to be looking at um, hundreds to thousands of generations down the line. And so to, to see actual whole scale changes in, a, in an organism or within a species, you'd be looking at um, species that would uh, have reproduced several thousand times. And that's why we can see some forms of evolution by natural selection in things like bacteria, because they do reproduce quickly. Whereas within organisms like humans um, or large animals, because they don't reproduce as frequently, it isn't as apparent and obvious. And so one example of how we know natural selection and evolution is true is by looking at um, fossils. And so what this animation shows is how fossils are formed. So when, they, when an organism dies, it has to be covered over very, very quickly by a layer of sediment so that decomposers can't get at it and break it down. And over millions of years, due to compaction um, and due to exposure to high pressure, the soft tissue can be broken down, but the bones can remain. And these can remain... Um, found within sedimentary rocks and so we've found a number of fossils um, that show um, evolution and by natural selection and if we look at this we've got a few places in which they can occur so for instance um, in ice so this is going to stop de well this is going to make it more difficult for decomposers to get to the dead material in bogs covered by water which can quickly get covered by sediment in amber if you've seen Jurassic Park you've seen um, where the DNA of a dinosaur is held within a um, mosquito um, and found within sedimentary rock. Now, if we were to look um, at the fossil record, what we find is the most ancient fossils are the most simplistic and we only find complex organisms later on. Um, and so around 600, I think roughly between um, five to 600 million years ago, we had the Cambrian explosion, which is where we get all of the major types um, of living things that we see today. But before that, we didn't have anything other than just simple organisms. Um, and any of the fossils that we found have always been in order. So when we radioactively carbon date these rocks that they're taken out of, we always find that the fossils are found within the right order. So for instance, you wouldn't find bird and mammal fossils older than 400 million years old. And so this is very good evidence to suggest that um, natural selection and evolution is true. Um, if we find all of the fossils in the correct um, age strata, then we know um, when they were formed. And therefore, if we wanted to disprove um, evolution by natural selection, all we'd have to do is find a fossil that doesn't match the pattern. And as of yet, there, is, there hasn't been one discovered. Another good piece of evidence to suggest that evolution by natural selection is true is if we look at um, the comparative DNA and so if we look at the DNA shared between us and chimpanzees it's very very high and if we compare that to our more distant relatives so things like bacteria then we share very very little in common with those and again all of the organisms um, that we can analyze fit that pattern the ones most closely related to us share the most DNA the ones furthest um, our most distant relatives share the least and so Darwin got some of his ideas from looking at selective breeding. And selective breeding is where farmers or 
um, breeders would select characteristics from organisms uh, that they wanted and then breed those organisms together. And so an example here might be um, with these two cows. And so if we had a group of cows with variation and slightly different characteristics, in selective breeding you would pick um, the characteristics you want, so this black and white colour, you would breed those together and so therefore the organisms would have um, similar characteristics um, to the parents. But obviously what you've got here is you've got some level of variation between the offspring and again what the farmer can do at this point is select the characteristics they want and then breed those organisms together. And what can happen over generations is that you can produce an entirely new species um, or certainly a species with vastly different characteristics and what Darwin noticed was the fact that this could occur in nature however it would be much slower um, you could still produce you could still produce um, different species from this method so that only certain varieties were or certain characteristics were um, beneficial and so those would be more likely to survive and therefore pass those on to the next generation and so at the round of the time that Darwin published his famous book, um, The Origin of Species, there was some contention over whether um, his theory was correct. And a rival theory um, came from this guy called Lamarck. Um, Lamarck's theory um, was that organisms could pass on acquired characteristics. So, for instance, if we took the example of a um, giraffe neck, Darwin, um, or Darwin's theory would propose that only the longest necked um, organisms would survive and therefore pass on their genes to the next generation um, and therefore those would have longer necks whereas Lamarck thought that um, if the giraffe needed a longer neck it could grow a longer neck and then pass that on to um, the next generation this clearly um, is slightly misguided at the time was believed but as we've discovered more about genetics as we've looked more at the fossil record his theory has been discounted, whereas Darwin's has lasted the test of time, and so much so that the evidence keeps piling up in its favour. And that's how we that's how we establish whether we believe a theory or not. We look at the evidence, and then if the evidence, if all of the evidence is backed up by the theory, um, we continue to believe it. If a new piece of evidence comes along that discounts the theory, then we have to revise it and think of a um, a new understanding.